This episode is part of Lanfrica Talks. Lanfrica Talks provides a platform to showcase efforts in language technologies around the world. To learn more or attend our live sessions, see the description below. Good day, everyone, and welcome again to our end of the year special talk, Lanfrica Talks 15. This is a very wonderful talk session because we'll be having Dr. Emmanuel, who is an Associate Professor of Linguistics and Digital Humanities at the University of Yaoundé, and who has done lots and lots of amazing work in language documentation, artificial intelligence, and Africa, and the intersection of these. Um, he's a very respectable uh, um, expert when it comes to African languages. He has done lots of work with various organizations from Africa, from North America, in Europe, and beyond. And so we're very, very honored to have him as our special guest for our end of the year special talk in, for the end of this year. So I will go with the bio. I will read the bio because it's very, very long. Dr. Emmanuel is Associate Professor of Linguistics and Digital Humanities at the University of Yaoundé. He's currently serving as the head of the Department of Cameroonian Languages and Cultures at the Higher Teacher Training College at, of the University of Betwa in Cameroon. He serves on the Governance Committee of the Endangered Languages Project and Humanistica, the French Association of Digital Humanities. He is member and he's member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Humanities and Arts Computing. His current research focuses on rule-based machine translation with epitome and voice recognition technologies for African languages with common voice. He is guest editor of the special section of the IJHAC, and he is a major grant recipient of the Endangered Languages Documentation Program and the principal investigator for the documentation of Bati language and oral traditions. He was a research fellow in the Bacola documentation project funded within the framework of the DOBES initiative. Thank you very much, Dr. Iman. We're very honored to have you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very honored uh, to be given the privilege uh, to give this uh, end of year special talk. And I really thank you for your invitation. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from Cameroon, Yaoundé, for just for the sake of uh, uh, location, because not all of us, all of you listening to this uh, presentation might be um, you know, informed about uh, where I work. So my talk is going to be on language documentation in Africa moving forward. Okay, I'll start by giving a synopsis of uh, the incentive of this talk. So uh, language documentation is departing from a tradition of introspection and deductionism that is very prevalent in, in mainstream linguistics. And uh, language documentation has spurred the collection of multi-purpose and open-ended resources reflecting the real life of the people. However, and according to, to my experience working in Africa, there seems to be a, uh, an epistemological and skill gap on the part of African linguists, especially those based in the continent to harness the world of, of the data that stems from language documentation. And uh, my hypothesis is that this could be due to prevalent humanistic or uh, humanist views about what is understood to be the language reality, as well as the persistence of uh, a golden standard scholarship whereby uh, the lone researcher is valued and is deemed to be capable of reaching at the discovery of, of, of the order of the nature. Well, now these are uh, two guiding questions uh, that are going to 
uh, uh, well, that, uh, upon which this presentation is, is, is built. So I asked myself the question, whether language documentation can serve as an entry point of African linguistics into the digital epistemic space? And what is the promise and the challenge of such heuristics? I will, I will, um, I will give more details about what I understand to be a digital epistemic space and, and all that surrounds these, these questions. So here's a brief plan of uh, my presentation. First, I'll start with a, giving you know, a report of my personal experiences in language documentation, and Chris just mentioned a couple of these projects uh, that I've been um, a member of or, or, or a principal investigator of. Uh, in the second place, uh, we'll try to elaborate on, on the language reality of Africa if it were to be seen through the lenses of language documentation, because uh, the impression I get is that uh, this is, uh, the language reality is sometimes abstracted from the reality of society. And in the third place, I, I would try to suggest that language documentation could be a possible game changer for the understanding of the language reality. And uh, the reason why I highlight the term understanding is because I, I, I uh, consider it to be an epistemic value in, in the search for, uh, for meaning or uh, for, for knowledge, uh, especially with concerns with regard to the language reality. Well, let me start with my personal experience uh, in language documentation. Chris gave, uh, again, uh, a couple of projects. So my experience in language documentation happened in Cameroon, basically. So the first experience was uh, in this region somewhere, uh, well, let's say, uh, in the southern region in Cameroon and nearly uh, in the um, coastal region. And I happened to work on the documentation of Bagheli, uh, which is a language spoken by a Honta Gatra, uh, usually referred to as pygmies, but this is a term I, I really dislike and I, I would not want to, uh, to, to use it here. So uh, the, first, the second experience, I'll not, uh, you, you can of course um, uh, uh, um, access uh, these, uh, the materials, it, it is freely accessible. This is the link below. And uh, I think, uh, yes, the, the presentation is being recorded. And if you want, I can share my slides with, with those who like to have them uh, uh, in the end. So second experience, still in Cameroon, but uh, this time around the central region. Uh, and it was with a community called Bati. So the material collected during this project is also accessible at ELA, which is the Endangered Language, uh, Endangered Language Archive. I think it is, now it used to be at SOAS London, but I think it is now, it has moved to, to Berlin where the Endangered Language Documentation Program is now based. You can find more details by uh, um, accessing the project portal via this link. Okay. And uh, another experience uh, is with uh, language archiving because uh, language documentation is part of language conservation, uh, which can be understood to be a package or or let's say a workflow that entails language documentation in the first place, that is the collection of the resources that bear testimony uh, of the life of the people, of, or, 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 or of the life of the people in relation to language use, or language use in relation to the life of the people, whatever you want. So the, 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 the next step is that you need to, of course, keep this material so that it can be um, uh, uh, accessed in, 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 in the long term. Uh, and, and this is done by uh, giving or archiving this material to some trusted uh, repository 
uh, there are some of them. And we, we, we have one in Cameroon, or I should say we had one because it is currently downtime due to, let's say, economic uh, problems and uh, technological problems. Uh, but luckily, uh, the material is hosted at Sadila, which is based in South Africa. So uh, it is not currently accessible, but the material and resources are, are all safe. And I, I was, uh, let's say, the promoter and the director of this archive from uh, 2014 to 2020. So this is another experience that I have with language documentation. Now, uh, uh, what did I gain from these experiences? What, what I gained, and what, when I say what I gained, it, 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 uh, it's in comparison with my, uh, my, let's say, the training I received as a linguist uh, in, 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 um, um, in my uh, undergraduate and graduate studies. Uh, so this was really something that uh, attracted my attention to the social dimension of language, something I was not really aware of or not aware to the extent of leading uh, me to feel a social engagement with the people who speak uh, a language. So the, 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 the rationale of language documentation is to save languages that are deemed to be dying. And uh, another uh, term, term that is uh, very, very common in language documentation is language endangerment. Because of course, as we can experience, or, or maybe we, have, we must have heard about languages being endangered for many reasons, political, historical, economic, and other ones. So as you can see, language documentation brings to the, post, uh, to the spotlight uh, 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 the em emotional dimension of language work. Uh, how do we feel? Uh, how do we uh, feel the emotion of the people or share the emotion of the people whose language is dying or endangered? And this leads us to look into language, at least it has led me to look into language not just as a body of data that can serve my uh, analysis, or my grammatical analysis or whatever uh, analysis I, I want to achieve as a linguist, but as, as a social behavior, as a socially embedded practice, not just as some resource for linguists sitting there waiting to be collected or to be made scientific sense of. Well, this is where uh, I think language documentation can help society. And I'm not saying that there, there is not a social dimension to linguistics. Of course, we know about social linguistics. We know about uh, ethnography. Uh, we know about um, um, uh, anthropological linguistics. But, but, but what is meant here by re-evaluating um, language or looking into language through the lenses of society is not just a matter of explaining language patterns or, or trying to, to find, uh, let's say, uh, regularities or patterns. It's really try to understand how language is part of the, the life of the people and how ultimately, uh, any variable that may affect language may also affect the life of the people. Uh, it, 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 the two are uh, um, inextricably uh, tied with one another. Well, uh, and the way I, I personally used to look into language when I was trained as a linguist, it's that language was something that we could find in the individual. Of course, through levels of analysis, phonetics, phonology, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that we are all familiar with. So now this leads me uh, to question, what would uh, the narrative of language reality, especially the African reality be, if that reality had been conceptualized from a social perspective? 
I've just shared with you the insight of the, the social awareness I got from my language documentation experience. So now the question I started asking myself is what, how would language uh, be like, or how would we look at language or talk about language if the social dimension of language had been, let's say the entry point into the science of linguistics. This is going to be uh, the second part of my presentation. And this will lead me, of course, to, to talk about some historical factors that have shaped the, the way that we conduct linguistic research, especially in Africa. And I think that colonialism has contributed to making and shaping epistemic spaces. So from a colonialist perspective, Africa is a linguistically chaotic place that needs to be ordered into discrete governable social spaces. And, and this discourse about language diversity being a burden is still, uh, uh, you know, you, you can hear, is, hear that everywhere uh, in, in political discourse, in intellectual um, uh, discourse about uniting Africa. So language is usually perceived as a conundrum, as, as something that is happily uh, surmountable, as a burden. And, 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 and for that matter, uh, the nation state has been postulated as an epistemic state that can help uh, bring that chaos, that linguistic chaos into some order. So uh, from, from, from that linguist, I mean, from that colonial um, uh, incentive, the language reality of Africa has started to be uh, conceptualized in terms of discrete spaces that colon, uh, colonialism has, 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 has started. This is nothing natural. This is nothing historically um, attested. This is very recent. This has started in the late uh, 1980s with colonization. And it is still there today. It is, it is even agnostic in, 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 in our scientific practices to consider language as something that fills uh, some spaces that exist a priori. Well, and the, the colonial discourse has dispelled the legitimacy of what was or what would have been the uh, epistemic space in pre-colonial time. Oh, I think we are missing a couple of, uh, well, okay, let, let us move to the next slide. And, and, and with that, of course, we, have, we, we, we are witnessing or we have witnessed a conscription of the space, of the social space in Africa through mostly language classification. Just let me just give you an example uh, of how languages are named or better how the language reality is conscripted following the uh, uh, epistemic space brought by uh, uh, the, the concept of the, the, the nation state. So let us take uh, the example of full full day. So if you go uh, to any reference catalog of languages, you will find that there's a language called Adamao Fufuldi. There, that there's another called Bagimi Fufuldi. That there's another called Borgu Fufuldi. That another is called Central East Niger Fufuldi. That still another is Masina Fufuldi. And yet another Western Niger Fufuldi. And Nigerian Fufuldi. And you can see the imprint of the nation states uh, in this uh, terminology. Adamawa is in Cameroon, Bagimi. So every, every, every single of these denomination of, of these terms is related to, 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 um, to uh, let's say, ge uh, geography. And I can show you how this is, this can, this is reflected in, in a map. So I, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I forgot to, to, uh, to link each of these points to, to, to a name, a language name. But, each of these points represents 
one of the, the seven uh, terms. So uh, I, I have kept asking myself, where is the Nigerian in Nigerian football day? Where is the Adamawa in the Adamawa football day? Where is the Bagini? Where is that? What, what is that? If not due to our, due to the imposition of the conceptual space uh, uh, brought by colonialism. Okay, this, this is a, um, a more, uh, well, another view of, of that, that reality. And what I'm going to talk next is the failure of language classification to try to find meaning from one point to another, from one geographical point to another. It, 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 it doesn't just suffice to name, you know, seven full full days. I think it's also important to see how these seven or, or more fruitful days, if, 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 if at all, how, how do they make sense? How do they uh, correspond to a reality, a united reality? Okay, so this, if you look, uh, you know, this uh, on the left side of this screen, there's a map, trade roads of the Kidiria, which is, I think, uh, an Islamic uh, branch uh, that was really very present in, in, uh, uh, in Africa uh, in the end of the, the 19th, or uh, let's say from the 18th century to the 19th century. And the map shows the roots of, of, of the pilgrims that were going, you know, to and fro this area. And, and you, if you look uh, on the map uh, at the right side, you, you, you can see that the trade routes of the Tajiria, you know, form or are in congruence with the geography or, or, or show or give meaning, uh, I wish to say give meaning to, to, to the geography of what has been split into, into, into seven full, full days. And when I take the case of full, full day, the, 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 the true, I mean, the, the same is true of many other named languages of Africa. So the, the, the point is, the point here is to, to, to question the validity of, of, of language names as they are reflected in current atlases or language inventories. And the ultimate question is, how do this geography, how do the linguistic geography account for the social reality? What is the link between the geography of linguistics, a linguistics map, and the reality, the social reality of, 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 of the social space, I should say. Well, uh, and I think we have moved from the formation or the formation of epistemic spaces in Africa has led to the establishment of places of power and hegemony. So there is a very uh, common equation of one language equals one grammar or one dictionary. And this, of course, with, Afri with the 2000 and so uh, languages identified in Africa, this seems like a dizzying undertaking. This seems like something that can be never achieved. And, and you see the reason why governments, politics, and sometimes linguists are reluctant uh, to, let's say, to promote the diversity and, and, and why this uh, keep saying language diversity in Africa as a problem. Because if you want to, you have to, 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 to produce a grammar, one grammar, one dictionary, one, 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 one for every one language, then with, you know, uh, limited resources, that becomes a problem. And we can understand why the language reality of Africa is usually, uh, you know, seen as a problem, as problematic. And for the, for the sake of, Solving this equation, this uh, economic equation. So here it comes to 
thinking in terms of economy, you know, the, uh, the relationship between what, what we gain from what we invest. And, and this equation leads to, uh, uh, let's say, trying to find groupings, trying to find some, well, uh, some places of, of, uh, that, that are more affordable in terms of investment. So with that, we come with questions of a reference dialect. So if you take the seven full full days that I have mentioned, and I'm, the, I'm not the one who created this full full days. This is sometimes something that you can uh, find in uh, Glottolog, which is a web-based catalog. This is something that you can find in um, um, Ethnolog, which is another uh, reference catalog of, of, of the languages of the world. So how do we do with that many languages? Of course, we have to make decisions. We have to choose a few of them or a few varieties, you know, by dialects. Dialects are usually uh, uh, understood to be mutually intelligible varieties. But that's another question. What do we mean by mutual intelligibility? intelligibility? How, uh, what do we mean by understanding something? That's, that's of course, is another question. And, and, and uh, of course, with the standardization of, of dialects, there is standardiz standardization of orthography, and this can be a source of conflict because if you are choosing between the seven full full day, if you are choosing, say, uh, and, and of course the seven full full days are not cases of dialect because they are recognized as languages, uh, but I'm talking of cases where uh, you have many uh, varieties that are mutually understandable uh, between one another, and yet you have to choose one dialect, let's say to write the grammar of, of, of the language on it. Uh, this is constantly and very frequently a source of frustration because every single dialect has emotional values with those who speak them, no matter their economic or political inferiority or whatever you want. Yet the logic of economy pushes us to, to, to make these choices that lead to conflict and to, to hegemony and exclusion. And uh, unfortunately, according to me, African linguistics has been too much aligned with the epistemic values of hegemonic linguistics, uh, such as rational belief, theoretical coherence, empirical adequacy, through justification, because of course these are very valid values. I, I uh, if I can speak that way, but if we favor these values at the cost of neglecting the significance or the understanding of what the language reality is, then we are into some scientific game, provided. I abide by rational belief, provided I, my research is rationally justified, uh, provided the research has theoretical coherence, empirical adequacy, and uh, provides sufficient justification for truth, then, uh, then I'm okay, no matter if all that makes sense with regard to the social life of, of the people. And uh, I, I, I try to compare uh, the topics that uh, uh, um, are, are prevalent in, in African linguistics meetings uh, with others that uh, happen elsewhere. So I, what I did is that I, I went and, 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 and scraped uh, uh, the programs of the last two workers, Vocal is World Congress of African Linguistics. So the last one happened this year, and um, the one before, I think it was two years before, so 2010, uh, 2020. And, and, and this, this is, um, let's say, a chart of the topics and the relation that they have with each other. Of course, we have language and languages. That, that makes sense. We have Bantu, which is a big language family in Africa. We have African because it's happening in Africa. 
but we have mostly a terminology that is uh, related to the values, the epistemic values of truth, of coherence, of everything, everything that is science and nothing that is social. Acquisitive, variation, alignment, nominal. Well, of course, we have contact, we have use, we have policy, but let's just try to compare it with what is happening in uh, Australia. And I, I did the same uh, thing uh, from uh, the conference, uh, the last edition of the conference of Australian Linguistic Society. society. And, and this is what I get. You, you get something uh, quite different. Of course, you have language. Of course, you have English because it's happening in Australia. Of course, you have Australian, but then you have terms like indigenous, you have terms like children, you have terms like uh, ethnicity, you have terms like aboriginal, which to me signals a, let's say, um, a, a type of awareness that is different from the one we witness in Africa. Uh, of course, I'm making no judgment. I'm, I'm just trying to see and drawing a conclusion from, from fact that can be uh, verified. Well, um, proof justification, that is the obsession to align with coherence, to abide by coherence and all the values that are given, uh, leads to the African reality being, um, well, this is um, a, a, a graph that shows just, um, <clears throat> sorry, just an, uh, an aspect of language classification in Africa, where you have, let's say, uh, language families on top. And then uh, as you go down the trees, of course, you go to individual language. I'll show you uh, what I think this is problematic with regard to understanding the experience of the social experience of Africa. So here's what you get uh, from, from current classification. You have a triangle. Uh, of course, but where we move from the top to the base. So this is what we do, because we start with, uh, if I can go back, we start with, let's say, the mother language uh, down to, to children. So as I go down, I create divide. This is what is happening. Well, this is not necessarily the way African view of Af African societies view, let's say, their affiliation. If I had to give my affiliation, my family affiliation, I will start by me, then I will connect to my brother and then and our sister. And then with my sister and brother, we'll connect to others. Well, let's say uh, uh, the uncles, um, siblings, even though in Africa, uncle, and, 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 and uh, aunt doesn't make much sense. But this is how I will proceed uh, and move towards the top. So as you can see, as I move up, I'm not dividing, I'm uniting. This is not what is happening. Let me come back again. Uh, this is not what is happening. Uh, yeah, here. So here, as I, go down the triangle, I create divides. Here, as I move from the base to the top, I create unity. So you, you can perhaps see what can be the consequence of, of, of our, our uh, epistemological frameworks when we are dealing with such a socially meaningful reality. As, as language. Now, I come to the third part. I hope I, I do not, um, I'm still uh, within my, uh, the time. So uh, I think I, I'll take another um, six to eight minutes uh, before I, I conclude. So now how does language documentation change the game? How, how is language documentation capable of changing the game of, of linguistics? Uh, because more or less, I consider it to be a game 
a game of values, a game of epistemic values. I think language documentation can be a heuristics, a new heuristics in what I consider to be socially minded linguistics. I think the understanding of African societies should be an epistemic value, value that guide the pursuit of proof for social good uh, in linguistics. Uh, a philosopher such as Linda Zakzetsky uh, has, has, has uh, argued that understanding something requires that one sees certain patterns in the reality of in question, because I've, I've, as I said earlier, uh, the reality of language seems so chaotic, so complex, that there, there seems to be no other way than trying to capture it through some bits of it, even though uh, we, 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 we cannot get the whole picture. But I think, of course, with uh, the new technologies, and especially artificial intelligence, we now have the, the tools to, to change this reality, to, to go beyond uh, the introspection of the link, uh, of, 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 of linguists, to try to interrogate what that reality is. Because I, as an African, if I go to South Africa, uh, if I go to Mauritania, if I go to Kenya, there is a sense of, let's say, of, of, of togetherness that, that strikes me from the way, you know, we feel, from the way we laugh, from the way about we talk about the world, we relate about the world. I think this convergence is something that needs to be uh, brought to the fore, for because it, ha it has, consequences for the life of, of the people in this continent. I, I don't want to hear to, to dwell much about uh, how, uh, how, uh, I mean, how many plagues the continent is subject to. Due to this belief of Africa as uh, a, an extremely diversified space. Yes, it is diversified, but how, how unite now, how, uh, how much unity is there, is something that language can, can, can help us to reach out. And I think uh, we can recalibrate language documentation to not just be about, yes, it is good to work for the safeguarding of languages, but we can just recalibrate the agenda of language documentation so that it becomes, as I said, a heuristic into, into linguistics, a new heuristic. And for that, of course, we need to fill the gap, in, in the skill gap. Uh, many African linguists are not trained to use or to harness the potential, the full wealth of, of the resources. And there are uh, some of them, a, a, a reasonable, sizable amount of data sitting in language archives as, 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 as a result of language documentation, documentation projects carried on in Africa. And I think it's very crucial that we, and, as African in our faculties, try to fill the gap, this skill gap. Well, uh, in filling this gap, I, I suggest a perspective uh, with which we can look into the language reality. I suggest to look at it from a rhizomic reality. Uh, a rhizome is um, an organism uh, with, of course, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving uh, a, an example here, which I, 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 I think I have cited it which I, I took from the, the internet. Well, of course, uh, a plantlet like this, or many plantlets can be sitting on, on the same root or a root that spread across, that, that, that cannot be uh, 
described in depth of uh, uh, um, discrete bodies. Uh, this is another example, another, uh, I, I didn't cite this, I'm sorry. I, because I took this picture from the internet, I, I should have cited it. Um, I, I'll, I'll do so, I'll correct that in, in, after this talk. Okay, so what is the promise of, of, of that? The promise is that we can uh, uncover the many body reality of language through uh, artificial intelligence. Personally, I'm not very convinced that the concept of language is, 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 is um, representative of what the language reality is. But that would be uh, very long to, to, um, to argue for here. I, but I think we can, without uh, giving up the current, current perspective into the language reality, we can just try another perspective. Why not look into language from a quantic perspective as a quantic phenomenon? Well, in physics, a quantum is the minimum amount of any physical entity involved in an interaction. The fundamental notion that a physical property can be quantized is referred to as the hypothesis of quantization. This means that the magnitude of the physical property can take on only discrete values consisting of integer multiples of one quantum. This is a quotation that I, I, I took from Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know anything about uh, quantum physics, <laughs> of course, but this will not be uh, the, first, um, the first time when linguistics try to borrow con concept from, from uh, natural scientists. Uh, we, 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 we talk about a genetic classification of languages at, uh, uh, after all. So if we have borrowed uh, genetics as a framework uh, to look into language, why not borrow quantum physics? But of course, this is something that I, this is a mere intuition. I, I do not have any argument for, for, for this being possible or, or, or how, how we can go uh, about it. But I, I'm just suspecting that such a perspective could be, uh, well, we, we, we could try and see what, 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 what we get from it. And artificial intelligence, I think, can lead us uh, to this. And I also think uh, we should have an open-ended representation of the language reality. Uh, we, we, we need to have grammars, dictionaries, everything that uh, would look like uh, a, a product that is uh, uh, finite, that, 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 that exhausts a portion of the reality. But I think this is a modern way of, of, of trying to cope with the reality that, that uh, is not always adequate. Why not think of and why not opening it up, writing, yes, a grammar, but opening it up to maybe other grammars or trying to build grammar into, uh, I would say, into some collaborative and, and wiki, wiki like uh, scientific product that is enriched or contradicted by, by, by inputs from, from, from other stakeholders. Uh, how can we do this? I think the, the Deep Place project, and I'll try to, to uh, uh, yeah, try to change uh, the, yes, uh, okay. So this is, um, this is a very interesting project um, that I, 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 I discovered. Uh, and I'll try to read with you uh, just to, 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 to see how it, try, it, it, it really correlates uh, the view of, of, I've tried to, to share with you about how we can look into the language reality. So it is called Databases of Places, Language, Culture, Environment. And this is a brief description of, of the database. From the foods we eat to who we can marry, 
to the types of games we teach our children, the diversity of cultural practices in the world is outstanding. Yet, our ability to visualize and understand this diversity is often limited by the ways it traditionally has been documented and shared on a cultural by cultural basis in locally told stories or difficult to access books and articles. Deep Place represents an attempt to bring together this dispersed corpus of information. It aims to make it easy for individuals to construct, um, contrast their own cultural practices with those of other societies and to consider the factors that many underlie cultural similarities and differences. Users can build, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was really happy to come across this work, uh, this uh, database and to see that uh, some of the, 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 the novelties that I'm, I'm trying to, to suggest in my perspective are uh, corroborated by, 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 this, uh, by, uh, by this project. So I, I, I invite you to, to visit this data, database. You'll find very interesting uh, resources and approaches. How language documentation can, can, can go about. So different perspectives are, are, are suggested here uh, of how we can, we, we, we can build this open-ended uh, database of resources and how artificial intelligence can constantly uh, derive patterns or reveal patterns, not only uh, from one place to another, but gradually as languages, as, as data is being fed into the database, uh, how we can get to a broader understanding of what the language reality is. And I think with this, I'm getting to the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Emmanuel. We're super honored and grateful to have you give us, give us this talk. And we really, I personally really learned quite a lot about languages and, and the way we think, as me as a researcher, thinking about African languages and how to model them. Thank you all so much in the audience for this oh, your wonderful participation. Wish you a wonderful end of the year. Um, happy New Year in advance and season's greetings. Thank you all and see you all next year for our Lanfrica talks, which will continue. All right, take care everyone and goodbye.